Hi everybody and welcome to our next finance lecture. This lecture focuses on risk, return, and the capital asset pricing model. Just a quick overview of what we'll be talking about. I first want to just introduce the concept of risk and return. And, and then we'll take a first, uh, we'll talk about calculating returns and we'll take a first step at measuring risk. Um, we'll then explore ways that we can reduce risk through diversification, which will then lead to another take on how to measure risk with our updated diversification ideas. And then finally, this will lead to the creation of the capital asset pricing model and uh, a, a way that we can estimate how to price risk. And then we'll wrap up the lecture. All right, so let me motivate the topic of risk and return. So first of all, the relationship between risk and return is a fundamental piece of finance theory. As an example, this is a very simple example. If given a choice between investing in a low risk opportunity that says it's, it's gonna probably pay you 10% uh, return on your money, or investing in a high risk opportunity that says it's going to pay you 10%. Well, we're not sure that we're going to get the 10%. Uh, so which of these two would you choose? Well, most people would choose the lower risk opportunity. If you have a choice of making 10% with a low risk situation, or maybe there's a risky one, generally we're going to go for the lower risk. So this principle is something that we follow in, f in finance, which is that investors need the inducement of higher reward to take on perceived higher risks. And this is, this is an axiom that flows through finance. And we're going to develop that in this lecture. Let's start by defining what a return on investment is and what we mean by that. So we can invest in a stock with the hope of earning a positive return on our investment. Right? We want to make some money on it, otherwise we wouldn't invest. Well, we need a way to measure this return. For stocks, we have two components that can contribute to our return. We can receive a dividend payment or the stock price itself can appreciate. All right, so let's work th with these two things. So just to recap, stocks have two returns components, dividends and stock price appreciation. And we can express this in an equation as follows. The percentage return is equal to the ending price of the stock minus the beginning divided by the beginning plus the dividend divided by the beginning price. And the first term deals with the stock price appreciation, and the second term deals with the dividend. And we can actually, we give those names. The percentage return is equal to the capital gains yield, that's the stock price appreciation, plus the dividend yield, the return we get from the dividend. And this allows us to measure the return on a stocks uh, on our investment from a stock. So for example, assume that we purchased one share of a stock at $25 and received $2 in dividends during the year. After one year, the stock price increased to $31. What is the percentage return that we achieved? Well, let's just do the math. We take our percentage return, it equals the capital gains yield plus the dividend yield, and now we can just plug in the numbers. 31 minus 25 divided by 25 plus 2 divided by 25, right? I'm just putting in the values from above into this equation. And that it's reduced to the capital gains yield is 24% and the dividend yield is 8% which is a total return of 32%, which that's not bad. Uh, at least that looks pretty good. Uh, but regardless, that's how we calculate it. So now, I said that it looked pretty good, right? Well, let's talk about that a little more. The previous example calculated what actually happened in this hypothetical situation. And we can call that a, a historic return. This is, you know, it's, it's, it's history. It happened. Um, however, prior to making the investment, we may have had an expected return of, let's say, 50%. And we 
didn't get 50%. So in this case, what actually happened was we, we fell short of our expectations. So that's not good. Um, alternatively, maybe our expectations were to earn only 10%. And in that case, we exceeded our expectations. Right? So we earned 34% return. And uh, if we had expected something higher, then we fell short. If we expected something less, then we did well. So that, that kind of gives us a hint of how we're going with, uh, with risk, how this relates to measuring up to our expectations. So now, let's, let's use these concepts to, to help us define risk. So the, the fact that what actually happens may, and really often does, differ from what we either expect or would like to happen, we can define as risk. So note, we're especially sensitive to risks related to underperforming our expectation. Right? If we're above our expectation, uh, we're actually pretty happy with that. But we are really not happy when we fall below our expectations. So now, it's useful to have a mathematical tool so that we can measure our concept of risk. We're in finance, we like math. So we have tools for these things. A common approach is to look at a distribution of either the historic or the projected returns and calculate the volatility, which is either the standard deviation or the variance, typically, of the returns. So the following slide shows two different distributions superimposed, and I'll just talk about what they mean when we see the slide. Uh, so here we have the probability distributions of returns for two stocks, A and B. And question is, is one question is which stock is riskier? So let me just explain this for a second. You can see on the, on the horizontal axis, we've got our returns. Zero is over to the left here. The average, which both of these pass through, is 15%. So it's a 15% return on the stock. Right? In the previous example, it was a 34% return. So that's what we're, we're looking at here. It's a 15% return. And then you can see these distributions. So we have under the red one, the likelihood of landing somewhere close to the average, uh, it's, it's greater than the green one. It is clustered more closely to the mean. It's less dispersed. So we can say that stock A, our red distribution here, is less risky than stock B. And the reason for that is because we have a greater chance of being further below what we expected with stock B by just looking at this. Now, we also have a greater chance of being higher than what we expected, but we're more risk averse. Uh, and that will guide us. We actually are, uh, we, we, we do not like to be below our expectations. So we say that stock B is riskier. Again, because there's a greater likelihood that we will be further away, further below our expectations than stock A's returns. So now, just to recap this, both stocks have the same average. They're, they're both at 15%. And the returns for stock A are more tightly clustered around the average than those of stock B. So if we assume the average of 15% was our expected or required return, then we consider stock A to be less risky as it does not stray as far from our expected return value. And more importantly, is our preference to avoid bigger and bad surprises. So while both stocks A and B have an equal chance of falling below our expectations or above, stock B will likely fall further from our expected return than stock A. So because we're extra sensitive to lower performance, we conclude the following. The larger the volatility, the bigger the standard deviation or the variance, 
the greater the risk. And that's our first takeaway for measuring risk through this volatility metric. The greater the volatility, the greater the risk. All right, now let's do a mathematical example of this. Uh, a quick reminder of the formulas for variance and standard deviation. Sigma is the representation for standard deviation, and the variance is just sigma squared. The standard deviation formula is this thing in front of you, the square root of the sum of the return of a given stock minus the average divided by uh, squared divided by n minus 1 for uh, a sample population. Okay, so let's go ahead and calculate the volatility. So example, use the following returns, calculate the average return, the variance, and the standard deviation for Acme stock. So here are some returns. In year one, there was a 10% positive return. In year two, a 4% return. In year three, negative 8%. There was a loss, and so on for five years. All right, so now let's actually crunch the numbers here. We, the first thing we need is to calculate the average return, which is just uh, we add up all of the returns from the previous slide and divide by 5, the number of returns, we get 4.8%. So on average, we, the, these add up, we received a return of 4.8%. And now we want to know, well, how dispersed were those returns? We can start with the variance formula, and we're just going to plug our numbers in there. We start with 10, we minus the average, we square it, and then we do this for each of our actual returns. And you get about 65%, you take the square root of that, and you get 8%. I'm just, you know, crunching some numbers here. The conclusion from this is the greater the standard deviation, the further we are away from our average return. And when we're on the left side of that curve, uh, it's just amplifying that we're in an even worse position because we're, we're, we're falling short of our expectation by even more the greater the standard deviation. So now, this is, uh, I want to just show a chart of the volatility of stocks and bonds over some historic periods. And the idea is that the, the volatility of stocks is much greater than the volatility of bonds and treasury bills. So just to look at the, the, the top line, it's from some standard deviations of returns on stocks and treasury bonds uh, over, let's say, from 1950 through right up to the recession in 2007, just before it. And you can see the returns for stocks are 17% on average, and the returns for treasury bonds, 10.3, and for treasury bills, much shorter term instruments, 2.8%. Uh, so you can see, as we would expect, stocks are riskier than government-issued bonds, which are even riskier than shorter-term government-issued treasury bills. And as, risking, as the risk component increases, uh, so does this re return, which is intuitive. And then uh, you, know, you can see by different decades, these re the returns have different calculations, so it does fluctuate over time. But the main takeaway from this is, is you can calculate these over longer periods of time, and you can see that uh, there are different types of assets that have different uh, risk, uh, risk factors. So now, let's just talk a little bit about um, diversifying risk. So in the beginning of the lecture, we saw that higher risks must come with at least the potential for higher returns. Right? Otherwise, the investor just simply won't put their money there. We also saw that more volatile stocks should have, on average, higher returns. Right? The riskier a stock is, the more the investor is going to need to be promised for a return in order to invest in that. Now, 
we can actually reduce the volatility. We use the standard deviation, right? But we can actually reduce the volatility for a given level of return by grouping assets into portfolios. This is known as diversifying risk. All right, so let's go through an example of how this works with diversifying risk in portfolios. And uh, let's, let's just say we're interested in purchasing uh, a pharmaceutical company stock. Now, in a given year, a particular pharmaceutical company may fail in getting approval of a new drug, and that would probably cause its stock price to drop. But it's unlikely that every pharmaceutical company will fail major drug trials in the same year. On average, some are likely to be successful, while others will fail. Therefore, the returns of a portfolio comprised of all drug companies will have much less volatility than that of a single drug company. In other words, it might be better for us to invest in a portfolio of drug companies if we're interested in the pharmaceutical sector, rather than just pick one. All right, let's continue this. So now, by holding the entire sector of pharmaceuticals, we've eliminated quite a bit of risk. But it's possible there's still sector-level risk that may impact all of the drug companies. For example, if the FDA changes its drug approval pro uh, policy and requires all new drugs to go through more strict testing, we would expect the entire sector and our portfolio comprised of all the pharmaceuticals to suffer. So now, but what if we held a portfolio of not just pharmaceutical companies, but also of computer companies, manufacturing companies, service companies, and maybe even real estate or commodities and other assets? Well, we would expect this expanded portfolio to be even less risky than a portfolio comprised of just one sector. In fact, we can imagine a market-level portfolio comprised of all assets. Such a market portfolio would still have uncertainty, but risk, uh, uncertainty and risk, but it would be greatly reduced compared to just one asset, or holding just one asset, or holding even just a group of related assets. So from this discussion, we can think of having risk as having two components. First, we can think of them as having firm-specific risk, or asset-specific risk. And then secondly, there's market-level risk. All right, let me explain these. So firm-specific risk is what we saw, which can be diversified away if we hold something in a portfolio. Market-level risk is the stuff that's left over. It just can't be eliminated. We just, we're stuck with it. All right, let me just take a moment to talk about the, the naming conventions that are used here. Firm specific risk, you'll also, you'll hear it called any of the following. Asset specific risk, diversifiable risk, idiosyncratic risk, and unsystematic risk. So these are all interchangeable terms for firm specific risk. Market level risk is also called by a number of names. Syst uh, systematic risk, market risk, and non-diversifiable risk. So these are, you, you'll hear any of these names uh, used in, in finance. So if you hear me use one or the other, uh, you know, this is what I am referring to. I want to just show a visual of what happens with diversification. I've got two similar graphs. Uh, just to make the point across. So in this, in this graph, on the, on, the hor on the vertical axis, we have the standard deviation of, of our portfolio. Uh, we have, uh, you know, this is, this is representative of risk. And over here we have, essentially it's the number of stocks in our portfolio. And this line you can see it's the blue line starts out fairly high when there's just one stock in the portfolio. In this case, it's Radio Shack. Uh, and then as we add more stock, 
our standard deviation of the portfolio lowers. And as we add more stocks and more stocks, you can see it's, it's approaching its the best case scenario, uh, which is, in this graph, a little bit above 15%. And with, that's when we've added all 500 stocks in the S&P 500. So we're not really going to do a lot better than this by adding more stocks. You can, this graph shows a couple of things. One, as you add stocks, the benefits accrue very quickly. And then beyond a certain number, you, you get improvements, but the gains are much smaller. The other thing that this graph shows is this green area, which is the best we can do. Uh, is eliminate to the top of this green area. And this green area is what we call the market level risk. That's just the stuff, that's economy-wide stuff that is macroeconomic and companies can't control or consumer preferences uh, and companies cannot control this. And then the stuff that companies have a little more control over is the stuff between the the green area, the, the top of the market risk, and the blue line. So this is firm specific and this is market specific. I wanted to show another version. It's a very similar graph, but it's got a little less, uh, doesn't have all the bright colors on it. And it's got a couple of the other names in there. So this is a little bit more gen generic. We have portfolio risk on the y-axis, number of securities on the x-axis here. And you can see underneath the horizontal line, we've got systematic or non-diversifiable risk. And this underneath the curve is the unsystematic or diversifiable risk. Right? So as we add more stocks to our portfolio, the overall risk decreases. And that's, uh, that's the benefit of having this portfolio. All right, I just want to show one more graph that helps communicate what's going on here with the benefit of portfolio diversification and, redu and reducing risks. So as we include more stocks in the portfolio, the volatility of the returns lessens, right? We are reducing risk. In this graph, this is similar to the earlier graph that we had seen, except in that earlier one, we had st two different stocks. In this case, we have portfolios with different numbers of stocks. And you can see that as we add more stocks to our portfolio, the, the dispersion, the distance from our average gets less. And we've defined that earlier as less risky, right? The, the more closely clustered around the average, the less risky our returns are. Um, so you can see this, this demonstrates that this principle that the more stocks you put in a portfolio, the less risk there is in terms of falling below our return expectation. How does diversification work? Well, diversification comes when stocks are subject to different kinds of events, such that the returns differ over time. So, for example, the stock's returns are not perfectly correlated. We saw that with the pharmaceuticals. Maybe some get approval and some don't, so their stocks are not moving. They're moving in different directions at the, uh, at the same time period, so they tend to counteract each other. So by contrast, if two stocks are perfectly positively correlated, diversification has no effect on risk. Right? It doesn't matter. If we had 100 stocks in the portfolio and every single one of them moved in perfect harmony with each other, then we may as well just get rid of 99 of them. There's no benefit to diversification. So the real key ingredient is to have um, this not perfect correlation, to have some less than perfect correlations among the assets held in the portfolio. All right, some conclusions to diversification. Investors 
are only compensated for risks that they bear, right? So we know investors need to be compensated for risks, for taking on risks, but really they're only going to be compensated for, ri for the risks that they bear. And if a risk can be diversified away, well, they're not going to be compensated for it. So in, an, in, a, in a competitive, in an efficient market, the only risks that are going to be compensated are the non-diversifiable risks. Right, the stuff that's left over after you've been, after you've fully diversified the risks away. So now, with that in mind, um, earlier we measured the risk of the return on an investment by using the standard deviation or the volatility. Now, after our examination of this diversification concept, we can see that the standard deviation measures something that we can call the total risk. It measures it, both diversifiable and non-diversifiable risk. So it, it really, it captures more than we want. We really, we don't want to capture the diversifiable risk in our risk measurement. So it, it would be preferable to have a measure of the non-diversifiable risk only, because in an efficient market, only this kind of risk is going to be rewarded. In finance, we define such a measure of non-diversifiable risk as beta. So for example, for stock I of our portfolio, the beta is going to be defined as the ratio of the standard deviation of the stock to the standard deviation of the market as a whole times the correlation of these items. So we scale the ratio of their standard deviations by how much they're correlated. And if we just break this apart a little bit, what this is saying is, is the greater the standard deviation of the stock itself, the greater the beta. The greater the correlation, the greater the beta. And this is intuitive because we know, well, standard deviation does measure risk. And the, so the greater it is, we want to capture that. Um, but now if, if the stock has let's say, a low correlation, then we want to take away some of that risk. And that's what that would be doing. So the lower the correlation, we actually scale back some of the impacts of the risk. The greater the correlation, we want to amplify the risks. So conceptually, what does this thing measure? It measures two things. A stock's volatility relative to the portfolio as a whole, right? So just how much it moves relative to the portfolio. And it also measures a stock's contribution of the risk to the portfolio. So the portfolio has its own risk measurement, and this is the amount of risk that's contributed to the portfolio by this particular stock. So again, Beta is telling us the non-diversifiable component of risk. We saw, just to recap, we saw that standard deviation, it does measure risk, but it captures both diversifiable and non-diversifiable risk. It captures total risk. We only want the diversif uh, we, we only want really to focus on the non-diversifiable stuff, the stuff that we're stuck with. And that's what beta is trying to capture. So we define beta in such a way that a stock with a beta of 1 has roughly the same volatility as the market as a whole. It moves pretty much with the market. If the market goes up, the stock moves up by about the same amount, and likewise if it goes down. Betas with a, with, that are greater than 1, they have greater volatility than the market. So if the stock goes up by a little, beta goes up by a little more. And uh, likewise, with a beta of less than one, it's a little less volatile than the market. 
right, when the when the stock goes when the stock market goes up by a certain amount a beta less than 1 will go up by a little less so now most stocks actually have beta somewhere in the range of 0.5 to 1.5 All right. You could theoretically could you have a negative beta? That means when the stock market goes goes up, the beta of goes down. And when the stock market goes down, the beta goes up. This in theory you can and some people I guess you know gold can do this. It can be a counterbalance in uh in in bad times and uh a little bit of a a drag in good times. But in general for for most companies their their betas are positive they they move with the market here's a chart of betas for a number of companies and you can see on this most of them are in that range that i was talking about right so 3m is a little less risky than the market with a beta of 0.75 uh, alcoa has much higher higher risk and so on. Uh, Walmart, there we go, that's almost zero, so it's very low risk. Its returns are very stable. Now what are we going to do with all this stuff? Well, we're going to use this to help us calculate what we should require to be compensated for holding these stocks. That's what we're building towards. So before we get to that, let me just talk about one last thing on the betas. Um, how do we even estimate these betas, right? I gave them to you. Well, the reality is, is there are many services that, that calculate betas. And, and you can find some are free, some are paid for. Um, these are a list of some of them, and you can just look them up for a given company. If you're really being adventurous and uh, wanted to slog through some, some analysis, you could calculate them for yourself. You could get historical data and really crunch some numbers. All right, so we'll come back to beta shortly. Let's talk about the risk premium. Let me introduce this concept here. So we started our lecture stating that we need to be induced to take on extra risk with the promise of extra return. Now we can think of this extra risk as being a risk premium that we require relative to a less risky opportunity. So for example, if our choice is between investing in a risk-free asset, such as the U.S. Treasury bond, and a risky asset, such as a company stock, our required return can be stated as follows. The required return equals the risk-free rate plus some risk premium, some additional payment. We can think of the risk premium as the reward that investors require for taking on the risk of investing in the stock and foregoing this risk-free investment. Again, the market doesn't reward all risks. All right? It only rewards non-diversifiable risks. So since the firm-specific portion of risk can be diversified away, an efficient market will not reward investors for taking this component of risk. The market rewards only the remaining risk after the firm-specific risk has been diversified away. The market risk. So the market level of risk is exactly what beta calculates. All right, now we can move to a general model that helps us determine what we need to be compensated for taking on risk. We can combine all of our prior discussions of beta and risk premium and create a general pricing theory. 
So the most famous of these is the Capital Asset Pricing Model, or simply the CAPM. And the CAPM states the following. The required return on stock I, this is a portfolio, so it's the ith stock of the portfolio, is equal to the risk-free rate plus the market risk premium times stock I's beta coefficient. All right, so this is the required return for holding a stock, for investing in a stock, is this risk-free rate plus, plus a premium, all right, plus a market risk premium times uh, the, the beta of the stock itself. In symbols, we write it like this. The return of the I stock is equal to the risk-free rates plus the beta of the stock times the risk premium of the market. So the risk-free rate, well, we know we can look that up. You can calculate the yield on a stock. Uh, you can calculate the yield on, on U.S. bonds. Uh, beta, well, we can look that up. We just talked about that. And the risk premium, well, you can look that up also. There are people that calculate that as well. And, uh, and this is at the market level. So you can imagine the S&P 500 r has a certain risk premium if you just for holding that portfolio. We can generalize this a little. We can split this market risk premium into a market return and subtract the risk-free rate. So sometimes you're told the market risk premium number, and sometimes you're told the market return number, and then you've got to subtract out the risk-free rate. But either way, conceptually, we're taking the risk-free rate, then we add the return for the portfolio itself, and then we scale it by the, uh, the stock's beta that we're interested in. All right, so let's do an example of this. All right, so the, the CAPM equation tells us, allows us to estimate any stock's required return once we've determined the stock's beta, risk-free rate, and market risk premium. So let's say we have, uh, we expect the market portfolio to earn 12%, and treasury bonds yields uh, bond yields are at 3.5 percent. If the if Home Depot has a beta of 1.08, we can calculate the required return for holding that stock as follows. The required return for Home Depot equals the risk-free rate plus the beta for Home Depot times the market risk premium. And let's fill in the numbers, and we have. The risk-free rate is 3.5% plus beta is 1.08 times, well, we have to take the market portfolio return and subtract the risk-free rate. That's our premium at the market level. So it's 12 minus 3.5%. And when you reduce that, it's 12 point, It's roughly 12.7%. So we would need a required return of 12.7% in order to put our money into Home Depot based on our view of how risky it is. And we could do this with any stock. And some stocks which have lower non-diversifiable risk, uh, those that have lower non-diversifiable risk than Home Depot will require less for us to, uh, less of a return. And those that we feel uh, that we have calculated to be more risky f for its non-diversifiable component, we would require a greater return. All right, some caveats on this. So measures of beta for a given asset can vary depending on how it's calculated. So, you know, we think it's this precise number, but you know, if, if you do the math, or I do the math, or a third person does the math, well, well, we might all get three different numbers depending on the data that we're using, or how far back we want to go historically, and some of the assumptions that we make in our calculation. So, we just, we, we need to be aware of the variances of that input. 
Another issue is this risk-return relationship rests on the assumption that the stock or the asset is priced correctly. Um, because we're using those prices for our historical returns calculations. And uh, this really rests on the idea that asset markets are efficient, which you know we know, given recent historical events that the, and, and other things, there are reasons to question how efficient markets are at pricing an asset at its true or intrinsic value. So the further that uh, the assets are priced away from their intrinsic value, well, our historical analysis of returns, um, you know, it might might throw us off of, it'll throw us off of the true risks. In spite of all these caveats, the CAPM is, is actually widely used by financial professionals. So this is, this is really, it's, it's put to use every day uh, among in professional investors and financial analysts. Summary of this lecture. Well, we started out by saying we need the expectation of higher reward for taking on more risk. Next, we saw that an asset's risk premium is the additional compensation required above the risk-free rate for holding the asset. Now, at the market level, the market risk premium is the additional return above the risk-free rate to hold the market portfolio. And for a given asset, the CAPM tells us how much return we'll require for holding that asset relative to the risk-free rate in the market portfolio. Right? So it's a really powerful model to the extent that it is accurate. And uh, this was our equation. And the generalized equation is simply the required return equals the risk-free rate plus beta times the market risk premium. And that wraps up this lecture.